Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're checking out the new, but also not that new CPU from Intel, the Core i9-12900KS. Of course, I did review the 12900K back when it was released about six months ago now in November of 2021, and was very impressed with the performance. Though it was a hot and very power hungry beast, leading us to conclude that the Core i7 models were more practical and therefore made more sense. So why has Intel made an even hotter 12900KS? That's what we're gonna find out, but before we do, Today's video sponsor spot is brought to you by MSI and their Z690 series motherboards made for Intel 12th gen desktop processors. A personal favorite of ours is the Pro Z690-A, offering strong entry-level VR and performance, loads of USB ports, and 2.5 gigabit LAN. The Z690 Tomahawk Wi-Fi is a great mid-range all-rounder, and at the high end, the Z690 Unify is an extreme board, packing a 19-phase VRM using 105 amp power stages for the V-Core. It's a great board that we use in our Elder Lake test system. For more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so if you were after the best of the best, the Core i9-12900K was it, beating the Ryzen 9 5950X in a number of productivity benchmarks while owning gaming. However, AMD is set to strike back shortly with the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D and its really fat 96 megabyte L3 cache, and with AMD claiming a 10 to 15% performance improvement in games, they could topple the 1200K, or at the very least trade blows. Intel, not wanting to give up the performance crown after finally winning it back, has been saving the very best 1200K silicon, binning it for a KS model that clocks higher. They did this with the Core i9-1900KS back in October of 2019. I have to say I wasn't terribly impressed with the result there, concluding that review with, I feel for most of you, Intel's Core i9-1900KS is a bit of a non-event. Personally, if I were in the market for such a processor, I'd save a few bucks and get the year old 900K. Worst case, if you get a dud, it'll be a few hundred megahertz slower, but you'll also have two years of extra warranty. Quite bizarrely, despite charging at least 15% more for the 900KS, for less than 10% performance over the standard model, Intel slashed the standard warranty from three years to just 12 months. Thankfully, this time they haven't done that. So the 1200KS comes with the same three year warranty period as the standard 1200K. That said, the rest of the specs are just as underwhelming. Whereas the 1200K has a maximum turbo frequency of 5.2 GHz with a base of 3.2 GHz, the 1200KS clocks to 5.5 GHz for the turbo and 3.4 GHz for the base, which has increased the TDP to 150 watts, up from 125 watts. So as impressive as a 5.5 GHz turbo frequency is, we're only talking about a 6% boost over the original model. Now, how underwhelming the 1200KS ultimately is will depend largely on the price, and unfortunately, I don't have any good news here. Early listings in the US placed it at at least $800 US, while here in Australia it costs $1,200 AUD. That means in the US, the 1200KS is fetching a 33% premium, while here in Australia, it's 50%. And the thing is, I'm not sure how accurate the US pricing was, as it was based on an early Newegg listing that was pulled. It could very well be $900 US, which would be a 50% premium. Here in Australia, Intel did have a pre-sales embargo, which started on March 29th, basically a week-long pre-order period, and pricing started at $1,200 Australian. Now, you know what we think about pre-orders, and while you should have a good idea of what you're getting with the 1200KS just based on the specs, we're still not fans of how Intel's handled the release of this product. In an effort to avoid negative or even lukewarm reviews before or on the release day, Intel has withheld review samples, samples that have been ready for over a month now. Instead, Intel has informed us that our sample will ship out on the 5th, so we won't get it until about a week after pre-orders arrive. Thankfully though, I have been able to secure a sample via alternative means, and this has allowed us to provide a day one review. Now, because a 300 megahertz turbo boost overclock isn't exactly exciting and would make for a very boring benchmark session, I've gone back and retested the 1200K and 1200KS using the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti with G-Skills new Trident Z5 RGB DDR5 memory with CL32393902 timings. 
I've also included a configuration for the 1200K using dual rank DDR4 3200CL14 memory for comparison, though I didn't bother using this configuration for the 1200KS because you'd really only use that part with DDR5 memory given the price. Then on AMD's side, I've also included some updated data with the Ryzen 9 5950X, 5900X, and Ryzen 7 5800X, again using the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti with DDR4 3200 dual rank CL14 memory. All testing takes place using Windows 11 with resize or bar enabled using the latest display drivers and motherboard BIOS versions. Before we dive into the gaming benchmarks though, I'll quickly go over some application benchmarks. So let's get into it. Starting with Cinebench R23, we find that the 1200KS is indeed 6% faster than the 1200K, so no surprises there. This is of course an all-core workload, and here the 1200KS clocked to 5GHz, which is a very impressive all-core frequency. Then for single-core performance, we're again looking at a 6% performance uplift, as the 1200KS clocks up to 5.5GHz, so a 300MHz boost over the 1200K. The 7-zip file manager benchmark also shows a 6% performance boost for the 1200KS over the original model for decompression work. And you're not going to believe this, but the 1200KS was exactly 6% faster than the 1200K in the Corona benchmark. Bucking the trend is Adobe Photoshop 2022. Here we're only looking at a 2% performance improvement for the new overclocked KS model. The last application benchmark that we're going to bother with is Blender Open Data, and here the 1200KS was 5% faster than the 1200K, so pretty much what we've come to expect. Now, for that extra 5% performance, the total system power usage increased by almost 20%, hitting 426 watts, which is pretty insane, especially given the 5950X peaked to just 221 watts, meaning the 1200KS uses almost twice as much power despite being slower in this application. As a side note, for those of you wondering how the 5950X uses less power than the 5800X and 5900X, this is due to the binning process. The 16-core processor uses higher quality silicon. Unsurprisingly, the 1200KS is a difficult CPU to keep cool. I was using the MSI Core Liquid S360 All-in-One Liquid Cooler, which is very good, and still the 12600K peaked at 102 degrees Celsius inside the Corsair Obsidian 500D with a 21 degree ambient temperature. This peak temperature was recorded after five minutes of the Cinebench R23 loop test, though the same 5 GHz all-core frequency was maintained for the next 55 minutes. So although it ran very hot, it didn't thermal throttle. As for overclocking, I didn't try and bother push the 12600K any further, as it's clearly thermally limited in our setup. I imagine very few will seriously overclock this CPU. It seems like something reserved for extreme overclocking using liquid nitrogen. Okay, time for the gaming benchmarks. And again, this time I'm using the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti. Starting with Far Cry 6, which is a lightly threaded game that only leans heavily on the primary thread, we see that the increased IPC of Elder Lake is of great benefit here. Using the same DDR4-3200 memory, the 1200K is 24% faster than the 5950X. Then with DDR5-6400, the 1200K enjoyed a mild 8% performance bump, and the 1200KS was just 1% faster again. So the increased clock frequency of the 1200KS doesn't amount to much here, but if you're looking for the ultimate setup for playing Far Cry 6 at the highest frame rates possible, then the 1200K was 35% faster than the 5950X. You could squeeze a little more out of the 5950X with low latency DDR4-3800 memory, but it won't be much better than the Samsung B-Dice stuff that we're testing here. Horizon Zero Dawn is less CPU limited, despite the fact that we're using slightly dialed down quality settings. We saw a 5% performance boost from DDR4-3200 to DDR5-6400 with the 1200K, but from the 1200K to the 1200KS, we're looking at no added performance in this title. The Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege Extraction results are interesting, as here we almost appear GPU limited, as the 1200K and Zen 3 processors delivered virtually the same level of performance. However, the slightly higher clocked 1200KS was able to push a little further, boosting performance by 9%, which is surprising given we've seen little to no performance advantage for the KS model in the other games tested. The Watch Dogs Legion results are interesting with the RTX 3090 Ti. The 1200K is seen to be 14% faster than the 5950X using DDR4-3200 memory, while DDR5-6400 offers the 1200K a further 18% boost, making it now 34% faster than the 5950X. Sadly, however, the 1200KS is really no faster than the 1200K. 
The Rift Breaker results are quite extreme in regards to how much faster the 12th gen Core i9 processors are than AMD Zen 3 range when paired with DDR5 6400 memory. The 12900KS is seen to be 47% faster than the 5950X, which is a massive performance uplift. Even using the same DDR4 3200 memory, the 12900K was just 22% faster than the 5950X. The margins seen in Shah of the Tomb Raider are less significant. Here the 12900K using DDR4 3200 memory was just 8% faster than the 5950X, while switching to DDR5 6400 only improved frame rates by 3%. Then we see basically no performance difference between the 1200K and 1200KS. Hitman 3 is another game that enjoys the added bandwidth DDR5 brings, as here the 1200K was 22% faster using DDR5 6400 memory, opposed to DDR4 3200. When using the same DDR4 memory as the AMD Zen 3 processors, the 1200K was 14% faster than the 5950X. However, once again we see that the 1200KS offers no real benefit over the 1200K, boosting performance in this example by just 2%. The last game we're going to look at is Cyberpunk 2077, and again, the 1200KS is really no faster than the 1200K, improving the average frame rate by a single frame. The 1200K saw a 7% boost to the average frame rate when going from DDR4 3200 to DDR5 6400, and a 15% improvement in 1% low performance. When compared to the 5950X, the 1200KS was 24% faster, and of course, it is using much higher clocked DDR5 memory. Now, when it comes to total system power usage in games, the 1200KS consumes 20 watts more than the 1200K, increasing power consumption by a mere 4%. Not a huge margin by any means, but given we saw little to no performance improvement, it does hurt efficiency. The Core i9 1200K reminds me of another recently released product, the GeForce RTX 3090 Ti, in the sense that it's very similar to the part that came before it with a slight overclock for a negligible performance uplift, let's say, and it does come at a hefty price premium. That said, as dumb as the RTX 3090 Ti is, it has a lot more going for it such as the improved memory density that helped greatly improve thermals, the massive new coolers that run quiet despite the 450 watt power rating, and a fairly consistent performance uplift. The 1200 Chaos on the other hand is the same CPU that doesn't come with a cooler, it's barely any faster, most of the time you can't even measure the difference, it's even less efficient and even more difficult to cool, and at least here in Australia it costs a ludicrous 50% more at $1,200 AUD. Frankly, for gamers, the 1200K wasn't even the best choice. For that, I'd go with the 12700K as it drops half the E cores, which are currently useless for gaming, but maintains all eight P cores. The 12700K also costs just 560 Australian dollars or $370 US, meaning you can buy two for the price of a single 12900KS. Hell, you'll even have some change left over. So in that sense, the 1200K really is another dumb product for people with more money than sense, and it's probably why Intel didn't send them out to reviewers. Right now, PC Case Key is selling a Gigabyte Aorus Elite 12700KF starter pack for less than the price of just the 1200KS. Not only do you get the Core i7-12700KF and Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Elite D4 motherboard, but they're also throwing in 32 gigabytes of Team Group's T-Force Delta RGB DDR4 3600 memory. But I guess for those of you with more money than sense, it is an exciting time to build a stupidly expensive and powerful PC. Something I'll embarrassingly be doing quite soon for my upcoming streaming PC, but that's a video for another time. Point is, right now you have access to mainstream motherboards that cost thousands of dollars. Take the ASUS ROG Maximus Z690 Extreme D5 for example, it costs $1800 AUD, couple that with the 1200KS and you have yourself a sweet $3000 AUD combo. Add in a GeForce RTX 3090 Ti for another $3400 Australian dollars and 64 gigabytes of Corsair's Dominator RGB memory for about $1000, and I've pretty well lost count of what this build is costing, but it's too much for me, so let's just wrap this up. So, Core i9 at 12900KS. Can't say I recommend this one, and I'm not really even sure who it's for. I guess if you're an extreme overclocker, paying a massive premium for bin silicon might make sense, but for everyone else, it's just a huge waste of money. 
If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like, subscribe for more content. We have a lot of new AMD Ryzen CPUs coming up on the channel soon, maybe some later this week. We've had to buy them, but anyway, a bit of a delay there, but hopefully we'll have that content up for you guys soon. So yeah, make sure you subscribe for it. Also, if you'd like to support the channel directly, we have Floatplane Patreon. You can, links are in the video description. Sign up to either of those ones. It'll give you access to monthly live streams to myself. We have an exclusive Discord server where you can chat with us and the rest of the awesome Harborbox community there. Behind the scenes content and Q and A's. So yeah, check that stuff out if you're interested, but if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.